let's get started here. Uh, right into chapter one. Right into chapter one here on page number, on page numbers one and two. So, this is, this whole chapter really is about an introduction to real estate. How uh, our real estate business works. How our real estate business is structured. That's basically the entire uh, chapter one. So, if you look here on page number two. What you'll see on page two is what it means, this discussion of what it means to be a real estate professional. Now, if you think about, let's say somebody were to purchase a property. Give me some examples of other money that might flow into the economy based on the fact that this house has been purchased. Anything. Appliances, right? Appliances, someone's going to probably buy a new stove or a new microwave or a new dishwasher or something like that. What else? Sorry? Taxes. Right, right. So there's going to be taxes that are collected, right? Documentary transfer taxes. The city or county is going to get more money in property taxes because it's going to get reassessed. That's true also. What else? Insurance. Right, you're going to have to go get a new policy of homeowner's insurance, right? So that's true. Give me two more. Yeah, you're probably going to remodel a little bit. Some contractors are probably going to be engaged to put new carpet in or new flooring in or maybe new countertops. What else? Well, you're going to go get a new loan, right? And when you go get a new loan, this is going to put money into the economy for the processor and the underwriter and the you know, document drawer and the escrow people and the termite people and the home warranty people. I mean, a lot of money flows into the economy based on the fact that a property has been sold. And you'll see this list here on page number three. Real estate really is a driver of our economy. It's an engine of our economy. And you can see this on page three. Look at all the jobs that are created every time a property gets sold. And if you think about, let's say, when the recession kind of really started back in 2008, you know, it might have started a little before that, but one of the first things to kind of take it on the chin was the housing market, right? Housing market tanks, and then everything else kind of go follow, kind of follows suit. If you look at this recovery we've had, what have ha what's happened to housing prices over the last year? Gone up, and what is, at least the economists anyway, what are they saying about our economy? We're on some road to recovery, right? So housing really is a driver of our economy. It's an engine here on page number three. Now, if you look at page numbers four and five, one word that I would write on page four for the exam, one word I would write on page four is the word stratified underneath the real estate marketplace for the exam. The real estate marketplace is said to be a stratified market. What do you suppose stratified means? That word strata. Or even layered, right? Strata like the Earth's crust is like the stratosphere or whatever it is, all this stuff that we've forgotten from elementary school. But the marketplace is layered, meaning that it behaves differently based on the price range that you're in. If you look at the super high end of the market, I mean like $3 million and up. This was not moving. Three million bucks and up was not moving like the low end of the market. You look at stuff that's like under $200,000. I know we're in Santa Monica right now. There's not very much under 200000 But if you look at some of the lower priced areas, people from L.A. and Orange County were buying houses, let's say, in Victorville, three at a time for ninety grand a piece. Or even if you look at the low end of, let's say, Santa Monica. Let's say the low end of Santa Monica is 600000 and below. If you take a listing for 550 for a condo, how many offers do you think you're going to get on this $550,000 condo in Santa Monica? You're going to get 50 offers on this, and a lot of them are going to be all cash, right? So stratified just means that the marketplace behaves differently based on the price range that you're in. The marketplace behaves differently based on the price range that you're in, right? So the real estate marketplace is considered to be a stratified market, meaning that, the, again, the market behaves differently based on the price range that you're in. Now, if you look at the bottom of page number five, you'll see that the market is actually dictated, of course, by supply and demand. How would you define, how would you define the term supply in real estate terms? Yeah, excellent. Like the inventory, how many properties are available? So when you have, let's say, supply levels that are very, very high, so you have a lot of properties that are on the market, and then you have demand levels that are very, very low, what effect is this going to have on prices? Prices are going to drop, right? You're going to have overall reduction in prices causing a buyer's market. 
You look back at 2008 and 2009, some old news articles from the high desert. The market was so bad. There were so many foreclosures. Literally, banks and cities just blew up property because there were so many up in Victorville. If you just do a Google search for like Victorville homes, you know, destroyed 2008, you'll find that there were so many properties that have been foreclosed on, such little demand causing prices to come down, right? And those $400,000 properties were like literally 90K after that recession. If you look at supply levels that are very, very low, it's now end of 2013, early 2014, when you have very, very low supply, wasn't this what everyone was talking about this past summer? Supply levels, if you were reading the news, supply levels were so low. Most cities that, let's say a city carried 300 houses for sale normally, it might have had like 80. I mean, there was like no inventory. Demand was relatively high. What's happened to prices over the last, let's say, 15 months? Prices have gone up like crazy, right? So this, of course, is going to be a seller's market. So on a macro level at the bottom of page number five, just kind of realizing where the economy is and just realizing how supply and demand levels look, this is going to dictate prices in a given area, right? So if the question on the exam were to say, real estate markets that have excess inventory, low demand, cause prices to go down and create a buyer's market, right? Very, very high supply, very low demand, prices come down, it's a buyer's market. When you have low supply and high demand, prices go up, and this is, of course, a seller's market, which is what we've experienced, frankly, over, over this last summer. So are real estate markets always A, buyer's markets, B, seller's markets, or C, stratified markets? Your answer? Right, real estate markets are stratified. They behave differently based on the price range that you're in. As you decide what you're going to do with your career, you might want to think about what markets and what areas you're going to focus on. The truth of the matter is, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, you have to sell a piece of real estate in the next month or I'm going to kill you, would you really try to get a 3 or $4 million sale? No, you door knock the hell out of a couple of condos or some two-bedroom, one-bathroom home sites and try to pick up a listing and put a deal together because you know this low end of the market is going to behave a lot differently than the ultra high end of the market. Now, if you look here at the very, very top of page five, I don't want to depress you, especially because it's raining today and it's cold, but what do you think the failure rate is in our real estate business? That is quite high. Yes, right. I'm glad you know that. If you didn't, you're past the refund period anyway, so we're good. I'm just kidding. But I mean, the market is uh, a lot of our students have made a lot of money, you know, 150K their first year. And we have a lot of our students that really try hard and, you know, fail to get traction after, you know, working for four or five or six months. Really, the thing that if you had to chart out characteristics that you would want in a client, like think about this, an ideal buyer. What are some characteristics of an ideal buyer? Right. So cash, good credit, financially qualified. So I'm just going to put qualified, right? And I'm at the top of page five. Qualified from a monetary perspective. What else would you want as you chart out your best buyer? There you go. Right. Motivated. You probably want the guy to be motivated. Give me one more. Anything's fine. How about realistic? Don't you want your buyer to be realistic? You don't want that buyer that's going to say, hey, look, if I can find that house in Beverly Hills for $600,000, i am in. Because the truth is, if you can find a house in Beverly Hills for 600000 what are you going to do? You're going to buy it. Why the hell am I going to tell you about it, right? So qualified, motivated, and realistic. If you look at the characteristics of a seller, do you want your seller to be qualified from a monetary perspective? Yeah, you don't want the seller that owes nine fifty on the house, has an IRS lien, a mechanics lien, back property taxes, and the house is worth four hundred. I mean, you could still put that deal together. It'll be a short sale, which we'll talk about today, but it's still going to be a pain in the butt, right? So, but you want your buy, your buyer to be qualified. You want your seller to be qualified. Do you want your seller to be motivated? Don't tell me you want two million dollars for your mobile home in Pomona. You can't get it. You want it to be. You want them to be motivated. And again, motivated, realistic, kind of go along the same lines. The one that's important at the top of page five is must sell versus will sell, top of page five, and must buy versus
versus will buy. Must sell is job loss, illness, death in the family, foreclosure. Those are good sellers because, you know, they're motivated. Will sell is if I could get 50% more than my property's worth, I'll sell. Not going to happen. Must buy, I have to buy a house in the next 30 days. Will buy is if I can find that mansion for dirt cheap, I will buy. Do you want will buy or must buy? Must. must. Will sell or must sell? Must. must sell, right? Which is really this motivation piece at the bottom of page four and the very, very top of page number five. Now, one other thing here that's super important. If you look at pages seven, eight, and nine, trends in real estate brokerage, trends in real estate brokerage. We're in a pretty big office right now, frankly. I mean, there's like another story. There's another level up above us. This office is probably 15,000 square feet in Santa Monica on Ocean Park, right? It ain't cheap. So question for you. Do you think that offices, if you chart out like 10 years from now, the way our real estate business is going to look, what are some changes that you think might take place in the general brokerage business over like the next 10 years? It's more, online, more of an online component. Do you mean online just where you look at houses online? Or do you mean that like the paperwork is done online or maybe both? Like 95% of everything. 95%? That, 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 frankly, that's a pretty well-held position that more of it's going to be online. What's the counter argument to that? Yeah, you're going to spend 400, 500, 600, a million bucks on a property. Do you really want to do 90? And there's no answer to this, right? Who knows? We'll see what happens. Maybe there'll, there'll be a blend. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But part of what we're trying to figure out is over the next five or 10 years, do you think a big office like this, I should look over my shoulder before I ask this question, but do you think a big office like this is going to exist in 10 years? Do you think? Right. So you're saying you're going to work from home more. Who thinks that offices like this will not exist anymore? Joseph, how come? Too much overhead, maybe. So what do we do then? Where do we work? Robin was saying we work from home, maybe. Who thinks that these will still exist? Yeah, this, I, I, I hate coming here on a Saturday because when I started, you know, a long time ago, Saturday was like game day in a real estate office. And Saturday was like packed. You know, people were getting their open house signs. There's a hustle and bustle. Most of real estate offices, this one, and they have money, there's not even a receptionist here on Saturday anymore, which is wild to me because, you know, 12 plus years ago, there was, you know, there was always a receptionist. There was always a manager here. And there was always people moving around. And it's kind of sad, actually, because I could get a blindfold on and shoot a cannonball through this office and I wouldn't hit anyone. And it's Saturday, right, at 9.30 in the morning. So it, that's a pretty big change. What else is going to change, maybe? Or what won't change? Prices might go up more. Okay, right, right. Just with inflation, prices are going to go up. Yeah, I agree. How about the real estate agent's job? How is that going to change? technology, right? I mean, even, even ink signatures are kind of going away now, right? Now, when a lot of agents show houses, they just have an iPad or a, some sort of Android tablet or whatever, and they just literally sign on the tablet. And then they create a PDF file from their tablet, frankly. So that's a pretty big change. Some people say that for sale signs are going to go away, that, you know, everything's just going to be done kind of on your phone. So if you want to know what houses are, and that's kind of, that already exists, you can just hit a button and find the houses in a given area. Any other thoughts about how the business is going to change over the next 10 years? Maybe, yeah, video is probably going to be more ubiquitous. You'll have more video tours on. That's true. How about broker compensation, up or down? That sucks. <laughs> right? Broker compensation is going to come down, you think? Joseph, thoughts? But that's actually proved very resilient, right? I mean, this whole 6% model, I know as prices have gone up, you know, the, gotten a bit squeezed, like 5%, 5 and a quarter, 4 and 3 quarters and stuff. That's kind of come down on the super high end. When I say super high end, I mean 4 million, 5 million bucks. You don't get 6% commissions generally at that level. But, you know, maybe commissions will 
change. But that's, commissions have really gone up in whole dollars. You know, if we're still talking 5%, prices have like tripled over the last 20 years, but the commissions haven't been cut by a third, right? We, we're still at like four and a half, five, five and a half, or six percent, and prices are 3x what they were over the last 20 years. So just stuff to think about on page numbers seven, eight, and nine, where it talks about trends in real estate brokerage, right? Think about maybe where you think the market's going to be over the next five or 10 years. Some people say, and I pray every night that this doesn't happen, that the real estate agent is just going to go away, frankly. Right, so, client, okay, so clients are more savvy. So does that, does that decrease the need for a professional real estate agent? That's, that's, the other, that's, a, that's a widely held position, actually. And again, I pray every night that this does not happen. But the, you'll have less need for the real estate agent if the clients can do more on their own. You know, but I'll, I'll, the counter argument to that is tw about 12 years ago, in two, oh, God, almost 14 years ago now, in 2000, there was this big debate over this thing called IDX. IDX is uh, Inner Data Exchange. Basically, what this is, is it's like a system that allows MLS data to be layered on other websites. So really, you go to all these sites like Redfin, Trulia, Zillow, IonYourHome.com, all these sites, they get MLS data pulled, right? We used to have a wall between the MLS data and the internet where you could not get MLS data unless you were an MLS member. So a lot of people, myself included, were totally against IDX because if you can search the MLS on your own, we thought, well, maybe you might not need me as much, right? I'm not the gatekeeper of the information anymore. But now the gates have opened, frankly, and you can totally get MLS data through IDX on Realtor.com, Redfin, Trulia, all these sites. So just something to think about. We still are maintaining our 5 or 6% commission, and client, we're actually doing less work. Because 15 years ago, if you came to me and told me you wanted to buy a house, I'd have to ask you 62 questions about what you wanted, and I would go search for it. Now, how do we show property? Clients tell us, right? Clients are like, hey, I found this home online. You know, how do I get in or whatever it is? So we're working less, frankly, on the buyer side. We're not having to hunt as much. So just stuff to think about. I'm hoping that all of you do great things in our business. So just think about where we've been, where we're going, and what you could maybe come up with that would, that would you know, be of value to the real estate community. But anyway, how about here on page numbers 9, 10, and 11? Broker compensation, right, on 9, 10, and 11. So you know that generally... When we look at how real estate brokers get paid, who actually is the one, who is actually the one paying the commission, buyer or seller? Right, so the seller is actually paying the real estate commission. We know this. So let's say that you have Keller Williams on one side that represents the seller. Keller Williams is going to charge this seller, let's say, a 6% commission. Century 21, let's say, represents the buyer. The money for Century 21 is paid from the seller to Keller Williams, and then Keller Williams pays, let's say, half of that to Century 21. So when you talk about where commissions are going to be cut, commissions are cut here, right, at the negotiation from the listing agent to the seller, because that's where the total commission is initially negotiated. Is there some law that says that this has to be split evenly. That, no. no, right? So if you think about what the effect would be if you kept two and paid out four, the effect here would be what? You'd have more viewings. You'd have more viewings, right? Because we're all just animals. We go where the food is. If you get 4% as opposed to three, you're going to get more activity. What we saw last summer was this. But it matches to the market, too. Oh, Absolutely. Exactly. In a seller's market this last summer, you saw listing agents that would keep four and pay out two. Now, if you keep four and pay out two, you're in a position, frankly, where there's going to be less agents that are motivated to show your listing. But if there's very little inventory and you have the only house on the market in two miles, you have no choice, right? You're kind of forced to show this property. So if you think about uh, you know, compensation and trends in compensation, you know, just having a basic understanding of how this money gets chopped up, is useful. Stop me if you have a question, please. Um, please, yes, 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 me. Right. Correct. 
Right, exactly. So the, the thought is, is that, hey, doesn't the buyer pick the houses they want to see anyway? But you have a lot of really savvy real estate agents, or greedy, whatever you want to call it, cunning is probably the best word, that if, I, if an agent knows they're getting paid less, although they may show it, the harsh reality is, is that they may push, yeah, talk you into this one rather than, rather than this one. But I'm not saying that's the right thing, but you see that often in, in the field for sure. So if you look at pages 11 through 13, basically 11 through 13 is most of the things that you could do with a real estate license in California. Most of the things you could do with a real estate license, areas of specialization. Give me a few things that you could do with a license. Okay, I got you started. You could sell houses. What else? Commercial property. Same license in California. That's pretty good. What else? Mo right, mobile homes if you want to ruin your life. Yes, you could sell mobile homes. What else? Raw land sales, absolutely. What else? Yes, yeah, certain timeshares, business opportunities, leasing, property management, uh, all sorts of stuff. The majority of real estate agents, though, are engaged in what? What kind of residential property, right? The majority of real estate agents are engaged in selling residential property. These are important for the end of chapter quiz, which we'll do together here in a little bit. So if you look at pages 13 and 14, You'll see where it talks about broker-salesperson relationships on 13 and 14. You know that your broker doesn't tell you when to come in in the morning. If your broker doesn't tell you when to go home at night, you're an independent contractor, right, on page numbers 13 and 14, broker-salesperson relationship. Do you think the broker likes the fact that you're an independent contractor? No. The broker likes it a lot, actually. They, they like it. How come? Yeah, they don't have to pay their share of the payroll, the payroll tax, right? What else? There's no benefits, you know, all sorts of stuff. So it's better out just you're an independent contractor. They can't just randomly treat everyone as an independent contractor. Our receptionist here is not an independent contractor. They can't be. The only reason that real estate agents can be independent contractors is listed here, of course, on page number 14. There are three reasons on page 14 that you could be treated as an independent contractor on page 14. Look at number one here. The salesperson has their own individual license. The salesperson has their own individual license. If you're working at Wells Fargo as a teller, do you somehow have your own teller license? No, right? You're working out of the bank. Here, each one of us has a separate license number. Number two, reimbursement is based on sales made, not on hours worked. This means if you work as a receptionist somewhere, as an engineer at Boeing or whatever, you kind of get paid just for showing up. In real estate, we don't get paid just for showing up, right? We get paid only based on what? Sales, not based on hours work. And number three, there is a written contract that says that each salesperson shall be treated as an independent contractor. So those are three things that make us independent contractors. Number one, we each have our own license. Number two, compensation is based on sales made, not on hours worked. And finally, number three, we have a written contract that says that we'll be treated as an independent contractor for tax purposes. But be careful on the test. If the test were to ask you, in the eyes of the law, right, in the eyes of the law or in the eyes of the Bureau of Real Estate, we are always treated how? As an employee. Meaning, this is mainly for what purpose, frankly, let's be honest. This is mainly for what? For taxes, are we employee? Independent contractor, right? This employee piece is for what purpose? Liability, exactly. If we do something wrong and we get sued, not only are we in trouble, who else is in trouble? The broker's also in trouble, right? So be careful of this on the test. If we're talking about tax purposes or compensation purposes or work hour requirements, how are we treated? Independent contractors. In the eyes of the law or in the eyes of the real estate commissioner, we're always considered to be what? an employee of the broker, We're always considered to be an employee. Now, if you look at page number 15, there is a sample independent contractor agreement here. What are some things that you would probably want clearly spelled out in your contract with your broker? What are a few things you'd probably want spelled out? Commission split, right? For sure. That's how these companies get paid, right? They take little pieces of everyone's check. So you want your commission spelled out. What else do you want? How about fees? You know, some brokers charge literally like $400, $500, $1,000 a month to work there. Are you probably going to want that spelled out in a contract? Oh, for sure, right? What else would you want?
So we got fees, we got commission. How about length of term? How long that broker expects you to work there? Generally, how long are you expected to work there? Do you think? <laughs> as long as you're making the money. But they, they, don't, they don't have you sign a long-term contract. If a broker is asking you to sign some long-term contract, you probably don't want to work there, frankly, because if you get a better deal, if you start really cranking, and they got you on some not nasty low commission split, you don't want to have to be stuck there for you know, a whole year on a ridiculous commission split, right? How about how long it takes to get paid? Do you probably want to know, when is payday when you're a real estate agent? Do you think? Like the 15th and the 30th, do you think? It's every day. Yeah, escrow closes. A broker should not hold your check longer than two business days. Two business days is like the max. If a broker's like, we pay on the 15th and the 30th, you know, that's horrible because if you close on the 2nd, I don't want to... I don't want you playing with my money for, you know, 13 days. So payday should be like no later than two. Some offices, if you turn in a complete file and your check by like 11, they'll have your check turned around the same day. So if a broker tells you that they take a long time to pay you, obviously you should not be, that would maybe not work there because that's not good. You know, in the recession, I had a lot of our students that decided to work at smaller companies, not the ones like, like big ones like this. And they'd call me crying, and I'd say, what's wrong? Go, My commission check bounced. Like, your commission check bounced? That's impossible. And, of course, they went to work for a small shop. The commissions are payable to the broker. Broker used that money, you know, to pay whatever, and then cut you a check, and the check wasn't good. So, you know, it's important when you think about where you're going to work, the stability of the broker is very important because the check is initially made payable to the broker. So very, it's hard to do something about that. Now, if you look here really quickly on page number 17 at the bottom, very bottom of 17, are you considered an employee legally? Yes. yes. Bottom of 17, anytime you're an employee of someone, your employer also always has to have what? Workers' compensation. So the broker should have workers' compensation covered. You might want to make a little note of that somewhere in your notes if you don't see it in the book, but workers' compensation covering the sales staff, and we'll look at this in the, in the end of chapter quiz here in a moment, but workers' comp is required as we are employees, not independent contractors legally. Now, how are you going to choose a broker to work with? How many of you guys already know where you're going to work? Where will you work? Rob? In PV. Okay, cool. How did you make that decision to that, for that PV office? Right. Getting your license, right, right, right. But I mean, I guess, how did you choose that office? There's a lot of offices in Palos Verdes. Well, training, it sounds like, was important. Randomly. Yeah. Right, 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 right. What other criteria? So training is probably the most important thing. What else will you use to determine where you'll work? Training is super important, right? Absolutely. What else? Stability, Stability for sure. Joseph? Location. And location is kind of an interesting one because, like, if you look at two cities that are next to each other, um, like, let's say, Palos Verdes and Torrance, if you want to sell Torrance, could you come down the hill from PV and sell into Torrance? Yeah, but if you have a Torrance location, nothing against Torrance, but if you have a Torrance location and you want to sell in PV, when you have a Torrance address on your business card, oftentimes people in Palos Verdes might rather work with a PV agent, right? Or if you look at like um, even um, you know, Manhattan Beach and El Segundo, it's, you can sell El Segundo from Manhattan Beach, but sometimes it's hard to go from El Segundo into Manhattan Beach as a, you know, just a, something to... Something to maybe think about. So choosing a broker, super important. There's also at the bottom of 19, a mentor program in many offices. And Robin talked about a mentor program in her potential office. A mentor program is, of course, where an experienced real estate agent is going to work with you. Why would an experienced agent work with you? Let's be honest. Why, what's in it for them? They will take half your check, right? They'll take half your check. Now... That's quite common, actually. Third, if you're lucky, 
half is, is good. And that's, we, that's needed, right? They have to get paid for their time, of course. But some mentors will say, don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Don't come to my office until you have a deal. Once you have that client, I'm definitely going to help you take it to the finish line. And you're like, if I already have the client, I can figure it out on my own, frankly. I mean, at that, and you're going to take half my check. Some other mentors will say, you know, I don't know, I've been where you've been. I'll hold your hand. I'll walk you through everything. And I don't mind, you know, kind of taking you from I'm broke to I just got paid. So I would encourage you if an office is requiring or has a mentor program, I would talk to at least two or three of the mentors in the office. Make sure you have a personality fit. And, you know, just, just so you know that you're ending up in the right spot. That's important. Any thoughts about the mentor program at all? How many deals is it normally? One to three? Yeah, it's typically... Yeah, it's typically one to three deals. That's why you want to get a lot of those small deals out of the way. You don't want to pop a $7 million transaction and have that be one of your first three, you know. So you want to get those small ones out of the way first just so that you're not, you know. But isn't it that the job of a broker to be your mentor? Yeah, it is. But they, you know, most offices have like 300 agents, you know. And if a broker was going to, they, it just, there's only one person. So, yeah, it's the it's job of the broker or the manager for sure. Yeah, but they'll put you on, put you on with a dedicated mentor most of the time. Um, some offices have nine transactions with a mentor. Three leases, three listings, three buyers. So go freaking broke, right, if you have nine transactions with, with a mentor. So. Maybe so. Maybe so, yeah. So are these some things you'd want charted out before you sign? For sure, right? You're going to want to know that. Yeah, everything is negotiable. Everything's negotiable. So, but you want to know what the protocol is for that before you, before you sign with a broker, for sure. Now, if you look here really quickly on page number 21, if you look at page 21, this is a list. It's a little chart here. This is, of course, figure 1.3, checklist for selecting a broker's office. This is a page that you can use to kind of determine where you'll end up. Does the broker have regular meetings? Is there ongoing training in the office? How do they handle the web leads? How do you handle relocation transactions? Because a lot of the big offices have a relocation division. I want some of those deals too, frankly, right, as, as do you. So these are all questions that you should ask. And notice the book is suggesting here on this page, 21, that you interview with at least three companies. That's really, really important. Don't just sign with the first company, even if you know where you're going to go. You know, make sure that you're talking to, you know, Keller Williams in Santa Monica, this company here, that company there, and really figure out where you think is going to be best for you here on page number, on page number 21. Now, bottom of 22, a couple of things that I would ask of the brokers that you're interviewing with. Number one, I would ask what their top agent made last year. Why do you think it's important to know what the top agent made last year, do you think? If the, yeah, exactly. If the top guy made 100 grand, you know, just shoot me in the head right now. Top guy made 100K, your top guy here might make X million, right? So, I mean, you want to make sure that you're in an area that has, or in an office that has successful real estate agents. Very, very, very important. I would also ask, frankly, to talk to some of the people that have gone through, that have just been hired in the last six months. Ask if you can get phone numbers of real estate agents that were recently hired and talk to them or just Google them online, you know, and say, hey, look, I noticed you work at blah, blah, blah in, in XYZ City. Uh, just wondering, can I talk to you a little bit about your experience in that office? And because if you end up in a crappy place to start, the odds of you quitting are pretty high and then you'll just get out of the business, which is, you know, that might, that might be pretty tragic just because you ended up in the wrong company to start with. Now, if you look on page numbers 23, and 25, success in your attitude. There's going to be days in our real estate business that suck. I had a girl that used to work for me, 25 years old. This was back in 2007. Her first 60 days in the business, her name is Gabby. Her first 60 days in the business put three transactions in. One for 400, one for 300, and one for like 450 or something like that. Did she ever get a contract? She, uh, not really. I mean, she really just got lucky, frankly. I mean, her first 60 days, she got... Put three in. After her third escrow opened, in the next two weeks, all three of those deals fell apart. All three just completely fell apart. And 
she was obviously pretty distraught because she went from having like $40,000 in potential commission income to nothing. She was back at square one. That frankly deflated her and she ended up getting out of our real estate business and she tried to be an actress, which might be the one job on earth that's actually harder than being a real estate agent, right? And then she ended up, she's now a school teacher. But the point is, is that I always, I often wonder about what would have happened if those deals would have closed. I mean, she could have been a great superstar real estate agent, but you know, you're going to have days that suck. I mean, she just had a couple of weeks that were pretty bad for her, but success and your attitude on page number 23 uh, are, are obviously, are obviously pretty important. Now, one thing that I want to ask you, she, uh, just, uh, maybe so. Yeah, she, yeah, she's all right. Um, <laughs> she's not. She's not watching this, right? So she's good. Here, here on 27 and uh, and 28 role playing. Quick question for you. What happens if a buyer asks? And this actually happened to Gabby. One of the buyers was her friend from college. About a week into the escrow, her friend goes, "Hey, so how much are you making on this?" And she goes, "I'm making 12 grand." And the friend goes, "Give me some of that commission." Not in so many words, but she goes, hey, can you kick a little of that my way? You're going to get that from a buyer, especially those. Can you think of a company where that's their model? Their business is built on buy a house through me and I'll give you part of my commission. Who does that? Oh, a big one, national actually. Redfin, exactly, Redfin. That's part of their model. So if we start getting that in our real estate business, quite frankly, a lot of buyers are going to start asking, right? Now what do you do? Or aren't there companies like Help You Smell, I mean Help You Sell, <laughs> Assist to Sell, where their whole model is what? Discount commission. So what do you do when a buyer or seller asks for part of your commission? We'll talk about that. You send them over where? Well, these are all things to think about, right? But if you look at 27 here at the bottom, role playing, having canned responses to these things are super important. Being able to know what to say, how to say it, when to say it is pretty important. If a seller asks you, for example, can you cut your commission? You know, how do you respond to that? Another agent said they would. Well, Mr. Seller, if another agent is unable to negotiate their own commission, how quickly are they going to cave when we get a lowball offer on your property? You need a strong negotiator, somebody that's going to not only stand up for their own fee, but also the price we set on your property. So the fact that I'm not willing to bend on my commission just shows how strong I'm going to protect the price that we set on your property. So, or what if a buyer calls you up and says, I'm interested in a property, maybe they saw something online and they just want the address. Do you want to just give them the address? No, because they'll just drive by and never call you again. How do you respond to that? These are all questions that are answered in a role play, right? These are all questions that all have canned responses, but practicing these on page numbers 27 and 28 are going to be super important for the exam. And as you plan, as you plan how your career is going to look, you know, the average American will work 1,952 hours in a year. And you'll see this, of course, on page 29. That's about the average American work here. If you want to make some amount of money, let's say your first year, give me an amount of money that you'd want to make your first year. Any, any number's fine. Jeff, 150000 If you take 150000 and you divide it by 1,952 hours, this is going to come to about $75 per hour, roughly. That's what that divides out to. If you want to really build a great career, you've got to get this number up and this bottom number down, right? You don't want to work 2,200 hours and make 60,000 a year. That doesn't make any sense. That's insanity, right? So do you think it's important to work with buyers or sellers in order to achieve this? Sellers. sellers, right? We want sellers. When you work with sellers, you get paid more per hour. You're not out there showing property. You're not out there going to the home inspection. You're not out there hustling as hard when you have a bunch of listings. So if you figure you want to make 150 k about 75 bucks an hour, in your area in Huntington Beach, the average sales price is about 600000 which means that your average gross commission is going to be about 15000 This is 10 transactions, right? So if you did 10 deals a year, less than one a month, you would make 150000 So it's kind of 
figuring out this plan here on page numbers 29, 30, and 31. Kind of figuring out a plan as to how much money you want to make. And this, this excites a lot of people looking at these numbers, right? How 10 transactions a year. 10 transactions a year. My best month, which was December of 05, I did this in one month. Nine, close, but I'll round up because it's so long ago. But nine transactions in one month, right? So 10 transactions in a year, that's doable. It's definitely, definitely doable. So if you think about, by the way, how lucky you are, because is anybody here from our high desert office? The number one real estate agent in the high desert, he took our class, his name is Muhammad Alam. Muhammad sells nine, this year, he'll close this times nine, about 90 transactions this year. And he might make 450, 500, which is a great living. But damn, 90 transactions, that's like two a week, right? I mean, that's a lot of work for one person to be doing. So you're lucky that you're in an area that has such a high average sales price. At the bottom of 31, A time, B time, C time, D time. A time is the time that we want to spend, right? A time is the time that's going to lead directly to a real estate commission. That's A time. So obviously we want to increase A time activities, things that are going to lead directly to a commission, and we should endeavor to decrease B, C, and D time activities, right? You know, Facebook isn't on this list. Solitaire ain't on the list on page number uh, 31. Now, one last thing that I want to show you here in this chapter is, um, if you look at page numbers 40 through 43, just some tools of the trade, some tools of the trade. What are some things that you would definitely need as a real estate agent? Give me a few things. A cell phone is probably useful. A computer of some kind is, the car is always something that gets people thinking. What kind of car? Really? The Bentley. The old school Cadillac with a spare tire on the back, you know, right? Maybe so, right? Maybe if you're in an area, if you're selling in, you know, in Rialto, and Rialto is a beautiful area, but if you're selling in Rialto and you pull up in a car that costs as much as the house you're showing, there might be a bit of a disconnect. This is more of an issue like in 08, 09, and 2010 with everyone losing their home in foreclosure. Get a real estate agent rolling up in a brand new S-Class and, you know, how do you tell somebody who's crying about losing their house, you know, as you're checking the time on your Rolex, you know, it's a... Uh, yeah, you're right. It's a bit of a disconnect. I think we've all come out. A lot of people, a lot of real estate agents you'll find, you know, I got the Prius, very, very common real estate agent car. Um, but it's still clean. It's still clean, four doors. Yeah, exactly. You just don't. It gives a bad impression of you. Probably. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, a, a very interesting story is a guy named Robert who uh, teaches a few of our classes, some of them. And um, in 1999, he actually didn't have a car. He's been in the business since like 88. But in 99, he hit kind of a, kind of a rough patch in our business. And uh, he literally didn't have a car, taking the bus. And every time, this is for two or three years straight, he didn't have a car. So every time a client would come to the office, he'd say, you know, my car's in the shop. I thought I, thought I was going to get it back already. But it, the mechanic has it for a few more hours. Do you mind if we just take your car? He has the key to the house, right? And they just, he made it work. And, um, but anyway... Um, He'll tell you that story himself. I'm not telling you anything that he wouldn't tell you uh, publicly. What else? Give me one more thing. Maybe a measuring tape to, about, to, to look at rooms. Right. Have that in your trunk. Absolutely. A flashlight. If you're in an area where you're showing warehouse space and maybe there's no utilities, right? You might want to keep a flashlight in your trunk for sure. Business card. Business card's also... Navigation's probably... Probably important. Cell phone, right? Absolutely. Having phone with access to email, that's very, very important and basic today. How about, how about a tire? If, I, if you're showing property, even in Manhattan Beach, you look at a lot of the best agents in Manhattan Beach who are friends of ours. Raju Chabria, Ed Kaminsky, a lot of these guys, they're not dressed in a suit and tie every day. If you're selling real estate in Honolulu, you show up in a suit and wonder whose funeral you just came from. So it's, you know, it's definitely tailored to the area. 
Let me show you something really quickly on page numbers 46, uh, 40, 47, excuse me. Let's do a few of these chapter quizzes. Remember, this will kind of get us warmed up for the final here. If you look at page 47, let's try number one. We'll do this on a volunteer basis. Number one, oh, Robin, thank you. as being stratified, right? The real estate marketplace is a stratified market. How about number two? Yeah, majority of real estate agents are engaged, excellent in residential property. Number three is a good one. You want to read number three? Uh, Mr. Vincent. Right, so we're looking for the, there's three criteria. We're looking for the one that's not one of the criteria. Which one's not on our list here in number three? Is A, the reimbursement based on sales, not hours? Is that important that you're paid on commission, not hourly? Is that one of the tests? That is one of the tests. There's three tests, right? What are the three? Reimbursements based on sales made, not on hours worked. Number two, the salesperson and broker have a written agreement that they're an independent contractor. And number three, each salesperson has what? Their own license. Which one's not one of the criteria? B. B. The sale, does a salesperson in B have to constantly represent themselves as an independent contractor? Hi, my name's Fred. I'm an independent contractor with Keller Williams. Do you have to say you're an independent contractor on your card? No, right? So B is not one of the requirements. Let's do a couple more. How about number four? You want to read number four? Um, Mr. Oliver, number four. A broker ordinarily would be liable to salesperson's board. Broker would be liable to pay what insurance? Workers', workers compensation, right? Workers' comp. Let's do just a couple more here. Let's do uh, number, uh, page number 48. Let's try numbers eight and ten. Numbers eight and ten. Answers to all these are in the back. You want to try number eight? Uh, Mr. Cordy. Which of these is an example of a specific goal? <laughs> how, about, well, how about this? How about A, I will work harder. Is that specific? No. Ah, it's kind of not so specific because what does harder mean, right? It's not specific enough. How about letter B, I will improve my listing presentation. Is that specific? No. Uh, what, how, how, do, how is that? You know, it's, eh. How about letter C here? Letter C says, I'm going to make 10 calls tomorrow on for sale by owner ads and have three property showings by Sunday. That's specific. It's measurable, right? We know exactly how much we're going to do and by when we're going to do it. Perfect. Let's do one more here. How about number 10? Um, anyone, please, number 10. Anisia, number 10. Daily planning, what are we trying to do? We want to increase A, decrease D time activities. What else? Place more emphasis on probabilities rather than possibilities. Meaning, if you, as you plan your day, again, we're not necessarily trying to get this $9.5 million transaction tomorrow. That's a possibility. We want to look at probabilities, right, to make sure that we're actually achieving something. So best answer number 10 is going to be what? Answer choice D, all of the above. 